Well, welcome everybody. Um, gosh, I am so excited and honestly very, very honored to be able to kick us off in this amazing conference on comparative geroscience. So I want to thank you, um, major thanks to the Purina Institute for just inviting me to be here and to tell you a little bit about geroscience and where we're at and how veterinary medicine is poised to create a huge impact in this field that's really reached a pivotal point in our, um, in the science world. And so, um, let's see here, we'll make sure. So I'll tell you that, um, just as a disclaimer, of course, the lecture that I'll be giving are my own opinions and not necessarily the views of Nestle Purina, and also just share my disclosures, um, which um, I have no conflicts of interest, of course, related to this particular um, talk. So I want to tell you a little bit about the Center for Healthy Aging. And as you heard, um, I direct the Center for Healthy Aging at Colorado State University. And the mission of the center is to unite research teams across all of CSU's eight colleges to bring convergence to the topic of aging research through a transdisciplinary lens. And the fun thing about this job is that we have over 84 faculty, and they're from all the different colleges of Colorado State University. So I work with behavioral and cognitive scientists and other science areas that I really are outside of my own discipline uh, domain, right, my own expertise domain. But the area that I'm most excited about, of course, is comparative aging, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and as we continue to walk through this story, I want to tell you a little bit about Great Danes and granddads, and kind of how I ended up in this aging space, and help you understand sort of where where we're going. So I'm a clinician scientist, as Natalia mentioned, and by training I'm a board certified veterinary surgeon. And I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania um, back in 1990. And the University of Pennsylvania is a unique campus in some ways because they have a medical school, a dental school and a veterinary school all in the same place. When I was in vet school, and this is now going back to 1986, um, we took all of our first year classes together. So I was in class, my immunology class, virology class, everything, was together with the medical students and the dental students. And so from the very beginning, I kind of grew up in this environment where there was no dividing line at all between veterinary medicine and human medicine. And as I look back on 30 years of an academic career, I realized that how pivotal this was in igniting a passion in me for this integrated team science approach to thinking about complex problems, right? And so throughout that time period, I became fascinated with surgery and became a surgical oncologist. And I really love surgical oncology because in cancer treatment, it really requires the combination of multiple modalities, right? So as a surgical oncologist, you can't just know about surgery. You need to have a very strong working knowledge of medical oncology, radiation oncology, and you need to work together with those specialists in order to find the most optimal treatment pathway for those patients. And so I did quite a bit of work in that area for a long time, and one of the most inspiring pieces of that work was the fact that the knowledge that, of course, dogs and cats, as we know, get the same kind of cancers as humans. And so the opportunity to bring what I was learning in the laboratory and in the clinic and impact human medicine was very inspiring to me. And in particular, I really loved thinking about the comparative aspects of oncology, right? And my area of expertise was surrounding musculoskeletal tumors. I thought this was fascinating that the um, osteosarcoma, the most common bone cancer in dogs and in people, is exactly the same biologically. If you take a sample of osteosarcoma from a dog and from a, uh, a human and you put them under a microscope and ask a pathologist to tell you which sample came from which species, they can't tell you. And on a, so not only on a histologic level are they identical, but on a molecular level they're identical and on a biologic behavior aspect they're identical. And so this again was a, a very inflex, a big inflection point for me to understand that what we were learning would really apply not only to the patients I was seeing every day, but also to human patients as well. And so my area was really interest, my area of interest is really around limb salvage, and I was interested in this challenge of trying to get bone and muscle to grow after these ginormous defects, right? These big defects that happen after we take out tumors 
or maybe after a trauma event or even infection. And so much of my work was thinking about how do you get bone and muscle to regenerate safely in the setting of cancer, right? So if we're asking bone to regenerate and we're using something that promotes bone growth, those cancer cells previously there also, if they're anywhere else in the body, potentially could respond to those growth factors and promote tumor regrowth, right? So this is sort of this walking this tightrope between how do you do this safely in a cancer patient? And so that's what I did for a number of years. I really uh, delved deeply into regenerative medicine and how are these large defects exceed our regenerative capacity, right? How we basically have only a limited regenerative capacity to heal certain things. And finally, it kind of dawned on me that this is exactly what happens as we age, that we exceed our repair capacity as we age. As we age, we get more and more accumulated micro damage, and we're no longer able to repair that. So could we apply some of the things that I was learning about in tissue regeneration on a broader sense to help people and animals in their aging process? And so as part of this work, I became very um, involved with clinical trials. That program in clinical trials is very well developed at Colorado State University. And of course, this is a program where owners who have dogs, in this case that spontaneously occur can uh, uh, develop cancers, can voluntarily enroll their pets into a clinical trial, which is generally something that would be standard of care plus something new in order to develop different pathways for approval of these new novel cancer treatments. So these are therapies that are slated for FDA regulatory paths to eventually be used in humans with cancer, right? And we do at CSU have this very big track record of having accelerated the approval of certain novel cancer treatments in humans, patients, purely as the result of the success of those treatments in companion dogs with the same kinds of cancers. So throughout my career, I've sort of been immersed in this team science approach to think outside my own disciplinary expertise to address a larger issue. And I believe firmly that it's at the intersections of disciplines, rather than within our own deeply siloed disciplines, that the greatest impact is possible. And I think that geroscience is a perfect exemplar of this, com of this concept, right? If we're going to address the grand challenge of aging, we need to all think outside of the traditional paradigms and bring the perspectives of all disciplines to understand the complexities of the systems, as we heard, from mac macro to molecular, all the way through that whole translational bridge. And by applying the perspectives of different lenses, I believe we can make a bigger impact, and that's what this conference is about. So let's talk a little bit about aging, because against that backdrop, um, of course, I became interested in aging. Specifically, I was interested in stem cell exhaustion and the concept of cellular senescence. And if you want to know the story about how I went from studying musculoskeletal tumors to aging research, it's kind of a fun story, and I'm happy to share that story over a glass of wine. But for this um, particular lecture, I'll stick to sort of this, this sort of, you know, kind of inspiration. And that was that, um, you know, I was accumulating birthdays as well, right? So um, let me get back to this. So I was accumulating birthdays and they started piling up, right? And like many times in our lives, um, inflection points happen. And I became, again, really curious about how some of the research I, could, I was doing could be applied to a broader um, patient population and make a broader impact. Not everybody gets cancer, right? Not everybody has tumor or trauma, but everybody ages, and I was aging too. So I loved Betty White. She's the late, great Betty White, and one of the things that she talked about is that, you know, being in your 90s is good because you're spoiled rotten. They treat you with respect because you're 90, but little do they know that you haven't changed on the inside, right? You're just 90 everywhere else. Well, of course, that's the issue, right? Being 90 everywhere else is not exactly that much fun. And we know because as we age, we begin to experience this decline in our overall fitness and resilience. We begin to accumulate those conditions that we associate with older age, okay? And so for years, it's not surprising that humanity has been so interested in developing maybe this fountain of youth. We've been very fascinated with preserving youth. And this painting is actually going back to the 1500s, right? It comes from Germany. Many of you may have seen this famous painting of the Fountain of Youth. And as you can see on the left-hand side, you have the 
older women being carted down from the village to the fountain of youth in wheelbarrows and, and wagons, and then they are invited to take a swim in the fountain as they progress from left to right. You can see that their gray hair disappears, their wrinkles go away, and they emerge on the other side of the fountain of youth, fresh as daisies, where they're then dressed in finery in the red tent, and they go on to a feast of great abundance to celebrate their newfound youth. Well, unfortunately, we haven't quite found the fountain of youth yet, but we have seen that over the last decades, humanity is living longer and longer, right? We know that the average human lifespan has increased from 47 years of age to 76 years of age in a span of only seven decades. That's actually remarkable when you think about it. And it also means that as the world's population increases, a greater proportion of the world is older, right? So the blue line is showing the number of people over the age of 70. You see the exponential increase in the world. And then the red line is showing people under the age of 70. And those two lines continue to diverge. And so we're dealing with a potential um, crisis because by the year 2050, over 24% of the entire globe is going to be over the age of 65. That's remarkable when you think about it. And so I would pose that global population is a triumph. It's a triumph in that it represents a victory over many things that limited human lifespan for millennia, parasites, infectious disease, nutritional challenges, et cetera. But it also represents our greatest challenge because there's a rapid decline in people of working age, and therefore a larger number of people are depending on smaller and smaller pools of workers to provide health care, services, goods, et cetera. And we are already experiencing that pinch. Added to that is the fact that while our lifespan is increasing, our health span, which are the number of years that we live free of the burden of chronic disease, has not yet, has not kept pace. So we're living longer, right? But we're not living healthier. We simply just spend a longer period of time in our lives burdened with the chronic diseases that are associated with older age, like Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, diabetes. And the simple truth is we don't actually die of old age, right? There's no death program that suddenly begins and executes itself at some age, right? We don't die of old age, we die of diseases of old age. And in fact, we know as geroscientists, that the greatest risk factor for all of those diseases is age, advanced age. So rather than thinking about treating the diseases that are already occurring, what if we could treat the common upstream element, right, that is responsible for those diseases manifesting themselves? Um, and so um, the, let me go back one here. So despite the fact that we have made these incremental treatment successes and treatments for chronic disease, the biologic drivers of aging continue to march on undeterred by treatments for those diseases, okay? So even if we were to eliminate one of those diseases of age entirely, like let's just say tomorrow we were able to cure all cancer in the world, the incremental increase in human lifespan would be quite nominal. People project it would only be about three years in general because what will happen is one of the other diseases of aging is going to get us eventually, and that's the problem that we're dealing with. So it begs the question, is aging itself a condition that we can target and we can treat? So the interesting thing is we've always thought that aging is inevitable and unchangeable, right? It begins when we're born, it ends when we die, and there's nothing really we can do once that program is set to change that. And we've thought that because we can observe aging on every level, right? We can observe it on the whole organism level, as you can see there. You can observe it on the organ level, so there's a healthy brain there on the left and a person from an uh, older brain on the right. Um, younger tissue on the left, that's muscle tissue versus older tissue on the right. We can see it in our cells. And we even see it in our DNA molecules. And we'll hear from Dr. Horvath and Dr. Steiner later about the molecular changes associated with the methylome 
associated with aging, right? So we, so we see it on every level, and so we've had this long-held belief that it's unchangeable, but in fact, the long-held premise that aging is this inevitable and non-modifiable process turns out not to be true, and that's the exciting part. And we can kind of know this by observing certain cohorts, right? We've had clues to this for a long time because we know that if we look at certain populations, aging trajectories are not only variable between people, but to some extent modifiable, even just by lifestyle interventions or lifestyle choices. So we know, for example, that life's uh, long habits of exercise are longevity promoters, correct, right? You live longer, you live healthier. The same thing with good sleep habits, stress reduction, caloric restriction. Across all species that have been studied, these things lead to healthier longevity and increased health span. So this gives us a clue that perhaps healthy aging itself can be modified by deliberate or even sometimes inadvertent intervention. And to further drill down on this point, I want to give you two pictures, right? And Two people late in life, both of these gentlemen are 85 years of age. Both have been on the planet for exactly the same period of time, but we see two very vastly different phenotypes here. The man on the left is clearly really fit. In fact, I thought he was photoshopped, but he has his own TikTok following, believe it or not. It's like ripped grandpa, check it out, it's pretty interesting. And then there's the man on the right, who I think is maybe more typical of the demographic of those 85 and older, right? You can see that he's got some mobility issues, perhaps he's in a memory care unit, et cetera. And what's really fascinating about people in their eighth decade of life and older is you would think that there would be this equal spectrum of people that go from the very fit to the very infirm and this kind of equal distribution of people all in between those two extremes. But it turns out that in late life, there isn't an equal distribution. You either fall into one of two phenotypes. One, you're a healthy ager, maybe the Ripped grandpa here is a bit of an extreme example, but these are the people that are on the golf course five days a week and they're independent and they're still driving and all those things. And then you have this population of people that's on you know, several different medications. They're requiring some assistance with activities of daily living. And fascinatingly, there are not a lot of people in between. So this is a great example of how chronologic age and biologic age are somewhat uncoupled, especially as we get to older life. So either the man on the right has aged more rapidly or less successfully, or the man on the left has aged more slowly. We don't know which it is. We just know that somewhere between birth and 85 years of age, something changed in these gentlemen, and they began to diverge in their aging pathway. We have no idea when that happened. We just see this snapshot at the very end of life or the, at older age. So it begs the question, is our own aging trajectory modifiable, right? Can we hack the aging process? And so if we're going to talk about aging, we sort of need to have some common language about defining aging, okay? And for the purposes of this lecture, and I think from the lens of most people in general science, the way we, we define aging on a physiologic le level is that aging is the lifelong accumulation of damage to our body cells that occurs as an intrinsic side effect of our normal functions, of our everyday living. And we know that living things can tolerate some damage, but if that damage is not reversed or repaired, right, the accumulation over time leads to failure of the system, which manifests as disease, or in the worst case, death. And so to sort of drill down on this further, we need to understand what are the fundamental cellular drivers of aging. So in order to study this, general scientists turn to traditional models of aging. And these traditional models are things like yeast cells, nematodes like C. elegans, flies, and in some cases, mice. And all of this work understanding what happens in these different organisms as they age has resulted in a deep understanding of what happens to our cells as we age. And so what this has resulted in now is a very deep knowledge of the fundamental drivers of aging at the cellular level. And these are interconnected cellular events that eventually manifest as what we recognize as the diseases of aging. These are the upstream things that we're talking about earlier that then lead to 
um, diseases of aging manifesting themselves, things like cancer and dementia and other things. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because what's fascinating about the whole field of geroscience is that nature loves to use the same patterns and programs over and over and over again. We see this in vastly different organisms. You can see the branches of a tree versus the branches of our airways being very, very similar. Across all living things, pretty much, DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, and protein does the work of the cell. These patterns are repeated over and over again between vastly different organisms, and yet those programs are similar. So if we go back to our models on aging, what we see are vastly different lifespans among these different organisms, right? I mean, yeast have a lifespan of hours, worms maybe days, flies weeks, laboratory mice maybe years, and then humans, of course, decades and decades. And despite these very vastly different lifespans, the programs of aging are exactly the same. Fundamentally, they are repeated in any, each of those species the only difference is they execute themselves at different rates, okay? So once we know this, now we can think about these different cellular drivers of aging as the knobs that maybe we can turn to influence how quickly those programs execute themselves. And that's exactly what the field of geroscience is interested in. So we go back to our models, organisms, and we see these different lifespans. And once we understand what those fundamental drivers of aging are, we then now take that body of science, we go back to our model organisms, and we see if we can actually influence how they age. And indeed, we can. We know that in some species, we can actually reverse aging. And so we see some examples here from different uh, publications. The, probably the most um, interesting one here is the publication by David Sinclair from January of this year in Cell looking at the uh, epigenome pre uh, reprogramming for mice. And you can see two mice here who are litter mates. They're exactly the same chronologic age. And yet you can see that one mouse has much more um, evidence of an older phenotype, and yet these animals are chronologically the same. So the fact that we can do this in, a, in um, other species suggests the fact that we should be able to use some of those same strategies in humans. But of course, the problem is we run up against our old friend, um, which is the old translation gap, right? This is a tale as old as time. We all know it. We have all this discovery sort of piling up on one side of the gap, but we don't see those being translated on a wide scale to impact humans and companion animals. And it makes sense, right? Because these laboratory animals are not people, right? Yeast are not people, worms are not people, mice are not people. And laboratory models fail to mimic the complexity of human aging. People are genetically divergent. We're epigenetically extremely divergent. And our health habits, our economic status, our access to health care and clean water and food all influence how well we age. And there is no real way to mimic the complexity of that in a laboratory species. So the field of geroscience is really faced with some very fundamental challenges. Um, in one sense, we have a challenge because the regulatory process, at least in the United States, really doesn't recognize aging as a disease. You have to look at a d disease of aging, not aging itself. So we're still focused on this disease center approach rather than thinking about upstream. Many of the things that are geroprotective, i.e. sort of anti-aging or slow aging, that work in the laboratory actually are repurposed drugs. Think about metformin, rapamycin, some of those um, agents that we are thinking about when it comes to aging therapies, um, those are off, off, uh, off patent, right? And so there's really little financial incentive to develop clinical trials and pay for clinical trials that would lead to a longevity label claim. And of course, we know that if we're going to do longevity or health span studies in humans, it's going to take decades and decades and decades to complete this. And then one of the biggest questions is also, how are we going to ensure democracy and access, right? If we were to develop a therapeutic or intervention that actually slowed aging, how do we make sure that everyone has access, that this isn't just something that is only available to the very wealthy? So how can then the geroscience field determine the success or failure of an aging intervention, especially in humans, without waiting decades to know if it works? 
Well, there are a couple ways we can get around this. One, of course, is to use biomarkers, right? And this is a proxy for health span effect, essentially, looking at whether biomarkers change with or without an intervention. We can test interventions in people that already have a disease of, associated with age and look for disease modification, but again, that doesn't really show a longevity change, right? Or we can actually start with people of pretty advanced age and put them on something that we hope is a gero protector and wait 10, 20 years and see if that works. And of course, that's how the TAME trial, TAME stands for targeting aging with metformin, is designed. But the question will remain, if that does not have an effect on health span or longevity, did we wait too long, right? And so we need to have ways in which we can overcome these barriers. So let's go back to our two gentlemen here. We already know something about the cellular processes associated with aging, right? We described them with the hallmarks of aging, those progressive changes on a cellular level that lead to a higher risk of age-related disease as they accumulate. And the example of these two gentlemen, we know that if you could measure those cellular features in these two individuals, we would find that the man on the left has far more accumulated drivers of aging than the man on the right. And all we know right now is that somewhere between birth and 85 years of age, these two people began to diverge in their aging pathway. As time went on, they began to become progressively more and more different until we see these two snapshots and phenotypes, okay? Very different end results. So this observation leads to some really important questions, which are, can we minimize this divergence? Can we get the gentleman with the walker to look more like the gentleman that's very fit as he ages? Um, and based on the work in traditional animal models, the answer theor theoretically is yes. And if we think the answer is yes, then we need to know another really crucial piece of information. When did these people diverge? So if the premise is that the accumulation of these drivers are responsible for the cellular aging programs playing themselves out more rapidly, we should see a different outcome, right, if we were to modify some of those drivers of aging. And the biggest effect would be possible if we could catch that divergence early and prevent the end phenotype from ever occurring. So in order to do this, we're missing some very crucial pieces of information. We need, first of all, a model that better mimics human, human aging. We already know that bringing things that work well in yeast and worms and flies and mice to people is not necessarily going to translate well, right? We also need to know when during life does divergent aging begin. We've already said that by the age of 85, they fall into these two very distinct phenotypes. And so did that divergence start at birth? Does it start at age 30, 50, 70? We don't know, but that information is very crucial to us because we need to know if intervening with some of these different therapeutics or blockers of aging actually needs to happen very early on or can it be just as effective if it's given later in life? The problem is we have no way of knowing this in humans, right? We also need a model that mimics human environmental exposures and social determinants of health to mimic that complexity of all the factors that, Im that are impacting how we age. And finally, we need some kind of infrastructure to de-risk intervention trials so that we either win quick or we lose quick. We don't wait decades and decades and decades and millions of dollars later to find out that we're failing. So how do we do this? Well, now I'm gonna present two more pictures, of course, and these are both nine-year-old dogs. So these dogs are chronologically identical in age, but on the left you have a Jack Russell Terrier. This dog was the national fly ball champion a few years back. And on the right you have a nine-year-old Great Dane who you can probably tell it has a kyphotic stance, you know, and you can see the muscle wasting in her um, back limbs there. And because she was one of my patients, I know that she has lung cancer and she also has heart disease. So chronologically, these two dogs are exactly the same age, but biologically, the Great Dane is an older dog, a geriatric dog, whereas the Jack Russell Terrier is still quite fit. And of course, this makes sense, right? Because we know that large breed dogs and giant breed dogs live a shorter period of time, and that dogs based on body size have predictably divergent lifespans, and we've known this for many years. But it turns out that this is kind of a unique thing in the animal kingdom, right? Because in most of the animal kingdoms, larger body size are associated with longer lifespans. Think about the lifespan of a hamster 
versus a great, uh, an African elephant, for example. But the, the dog is unique. In all of the animal kingdom, the dog is unique. And it turns out that those cellular aging programs are accelerated in large and small breed dogs relative, large dogs, sorry, relative to small breed dogs. In fact, if you comb the literature, and, none of, and some of this is indirect evidence and some of it's direct, but if you look in the literature, you can find those cellular fundamental drivers of aging it accelerated in these large breed dogs. So large breed dogs have shorter telomeres, they have altered glucose metabolism, they have more rapid stem cell depletion, all those things that we know are important cellular drivers, we can find those in the larger breed dogs as increased and accumulated relative to small breed dogs. And the most important part of this is that where we don't know when those two gentlemen began to, to diverge, we knew that they were just different at age 85, we actually know when dogs begin to diverge in their aging pathways, right? We know that when that Jack Russell Terrier and Great Dane puppy, for the most part, when they are young, they age at pretty much the same um, pace. But then when that Great Dane becomes skeletal mature, or around that period of time, the Great Dane accelerates its aging processes on a cell cellular level relative to the small breed dog. And no other species has that unique predictable divergence. And the most important part of this is that they develop the diseases of aging just like we do, right? All the same things, osteoarthritis, cancer, cognitive dysfunction, frailty, some forms of heart disease. And they have access to similar healthcare systems as we do, right? This is a picture of our hybrid OR at Colorado State University. I mean, we have very sophisticated health care systems for pets. This is no surprise to us. We have advanced health interventions. We have a large population that's suitable for uh, robust clinical trials. And these animals are phenotypically diverse. Um, and of course, they have shorter lifespans. So that allows us to think about longevity and interventions as a way, as a short, in a shorter lifespan so that we can understand whether these things will actually work in a human population and benefit our companions as well. And they live in our environments, right? They sleep with us, as Natalia said, they eat with us. They are exposed to our lifestyle habits. Are we sedentary versus active? Do we live in an urban environment or a rural environment? Do we smoke? Are they exposed to our secondhand smoke? So this gives us a ton of really interesting opportunities because it allows us to think about comparing efficacy of various aging interventions in two very divergent populations that we know will be divergent. Short-lived large breed dogs, longer-lived small, uh, small breed dogs. And it's uniquely an opportunity to link the timing of interventions with known points of divergence. And this work here that I'm showing is by Trey Eidecker, and he did some beautiful work on the canine epigenome and you know, showed that this epigenome remodeling progresses through a series of conserved biologic states that perfectly align with major physiologic states in people, infant, juvenile, adolescent, adult, and senior. And these things occur in the same sequence but they occur at different chronological time points along each species' lifespan. The big takeaway from the media of this thing was that one year of a dog's life does not necessarily equal seven years of a human life, but there was a much bigger message here, right? And this, uh, this is so we can think about different interventions that have analogous, um, uh, similar age-related methylation patterns. So we can look at it from that perspective as well, which is very powerful. So it turns out that we've had this very powerful model of aging that's been standing right beside us for all these years, and I think has been traditionally very under-recognized in the typical discovery and translation paradigm. So what's the future going to look like, okay? How are we, as a geroscience community, going to leverage this powerful platform to achieve that goal of accelerating and de-risking longevity interventions for the benefit of not just humans, but for the companion dogs that we're studying, clearly. And I would posit that we are at a tipping point here, and veterinary medicine is clearly at a very big advantage um, in terms of being able to make an impact. If we can apply this knowledge to companion am animals and leverage the unique features that we know are present uniquely in dogs, right, we know we can move the needle significantly for both people and pets, regardless of species. So, 
I think there are still three key elements that need to happen in the near horizon to see this vision come to fruition. First of all, we need a lot more global education and outreach in order to educate scientists from all different disciplines about the power of companion dogs to inform geroscience. This meeting, I believe, is visionary, and I applaud Purina Institute for gathering us and convening us today, because to my knowledge, there has been no other geroscience meetings that delve deeply into the companion animal role in healthy aging for the benefit of both the companion animal and for humans. So congratulations on being here, and I think these conversations are going to be extremely productive in the next few days. And then, of course, we have some groundbreaking um, information that we're going to hear about later in this uh, session. The Dog Aging Project, Katie Creeby is here to tell us a little bit about where they're at and the different new findings that they have. And really, I believe they've blazed the path for all of us to have those deeper conversations. And as they continue to add to the body of knowledge, the field of comparative geroscience is going to be foundationally catapulted into accelerated impact. So I want to congratulate them for breaking that glass ceiling because that's where we're at right now and it's really created this tipping point that we're all poised on at the moment. In addition, I think we do need to collectively build a consortium of institutions that can execute high quality, hypothesis-driven aging intervention trials for canine and other companion animals. And I'd like to suggest that the way in which we do this is to build on the model of the ITP, or the Interventions Testing Program. For those of you who are not familiar with this, this is a peer-reviewed program through the National Institutes on Aging, designed specifically to identify interventions that extend lifespan and health span, but in mice, okay? And we know the limitations of this already. We know that's necessary, but we know that the limitations of the fact that we can't bring mouse to man or even mouse to dog. And this is really where veterinary science is poised to make the biggest impact. I think that we could suggest perhaps that land grant universities that have veterinary hospitals and veterinary colleges are uniquely um, tasked with developing research agendas that serve the com communities, that give them stewardship of the land that they sit on. So this is a great way to start, but I think these could be expanded and scaled into a larger multi-institutional effort. And I think this is going to be an important piece of how we move forward. As I mentioned, CSU has that very well-developed companion animal clinical trials infrastructure. We can scale that, and we can use that model to work at multiple institutions to ensure consistency between institutions and also to be able to create GCP-like conduct clinical trials. And then finally, I want to tell you a little bit about something that we're piloting at CSU called the Human Canine Dyad Biobank. And this is a longitudinal biospecimen collection over multiple years from both dogs and humans that are living in the same household. And the purpose of this is to see whether or not health trajectories in humans and dogs that are sharing the same environments are actually linked. We know things like microbiomes and other things are linked. But we're going to look at this more broadly, how social and economic determinants of health influence known, and maybe things that we still haven't discovered yet, um, the biomarkers of health and disease across the entire lifespan. And finally, we'd like to know, do pets living in the same household serve in some way as sentinels of our own aging pathways, right? Can we know if there's accelerated aging in an animal that's sharing our environment and can we see if that predicts our own aging pathway? So these are important things that we'll be piloting and are already enrolling in. And I think that CSU is kind of in this unique position to execute this, or at least to lead this charge, because we have the vet school and the Center for Healthy Aging literally located within walking distance of one another. As far as I know, CSU's Center for Healthy Aging is the first academic translational aging research center in the world to be directed by a veterinarian, right? So this is evidence that comparative geroscience is coming of age. Again, we're at that tipping point. So a little, a little bit more about how we're doing this. This is, we are currently enrolling human participants in the Colorado Longitudinal Study. This is a 10-year longitudinal observational study uh, designed to enroll 10,000 Coloradoans that will join us twice yearly on campus for biospecimen collection and in-depth assessments of physical, social, and economic factors in order to understand how these different things influence health outcomes. And among those human participants, we are identifying cohorts 
of participants who also have canines living in their same household and asking them to bring their dogs to accompany them at their biospecimen collection dates, wherein we will perform similar uh, assessments in the canine, okay, so similar quality of life, cognitive assessments, et cetera, and physical exam, and then collect similar biospecimens. Then those biospecimens are linked in the database, and we have data sharing agreements to allow us to mine the metadata and compare specimens from each of the libraries, human and dog. So this is a great example of how this one medicine concept can really powerfully catapult us into the future. And I think it will be a powerful platform to inform uh, comparative uh, geroscience from here on forward. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say that I think the creatures that we share our planet with, and particularly the ones that share our homes, really do hold the key to our health and longevity. And we have a duty to pay it forward to them, right? Because the truth is, dogs just make us better people, you know? And by partnering together, all of us, and reaching across disciplines, that is going to be the path forward to changing the ending for each of us, whether we have four legs or two legs. Thanks. <laughs>